talk to you this morning about your sanctuary and the seeds that we sow in our sanctuary. I heard a story this past week about a, a CEO of a big company, and he was getting ready to retire. And so he called all of his junior executives together, and he, he skipped over all of the senior executives, and he, and he called all of the junior executives, and he said, I'm going to turn this business over to one of you in a year. And he gave each one of them a seed. He said, it was, this was, this was uh, the 1st of January, and he gave them a seed. And he says, in December, I want you to come back and bring what you've grown from this seed. And so they all took their, their seed, and, their, and uh, a guy named Jim, he took and he put his seed in the pot. And he, his wife helped him, got some good soil, and they were so excited, and, and uh, uh, nothing happened. And uh, all the other junior executives, they were bragging about how all their plants were growing and how they looked so good and everything, and nothing happened in Jim's spot. Well, it comes back in December, and it's time to go back for the big meeting. And Jim told his wife, he said, I'm just, I'm not going to take my, my pot. He said, there's nothing and she said, well, she said, he, he told, told you you needed to bring it back. And so you should go along and at least take it. He said, well, okay. So he was in the, he called them all into the room and Jim was standing in the back and he, he put his pot on the ground. He's kind of ashamed because everybody else in the pot had beautiful plants and flowers and just gorgeous, gorgeous plants in them. And, and uh, so the CEO got up and he looked at everybody and he, he said, Jim, I'd like for you to get your pot and bring it up to the front. And Jim was like, he's so embarrassed. And so he went up there and he set the pot up there and, and he said, I'd like to introduce to you all the new CEO of this company. And Jim was like, I don't understand. He said, well, he said, whenever I gave everybody the seeds, he said, I boiled all the seeds before I gave them to you, and they were all dead seeds. And I just wanted to see who is honest among you. It's important to be honest. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you will. Um, God's created us as temples, our body. The scripture says, I'm going to read it to you in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light and dark? Or what harmony has Christ and Belial or the devil? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? And this is talking about a, a, a lot of things. You could spread this out with, with being in partners with, who, who, with people who are unbelievers. It, you, it, 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 it's talking about... Uh, marrying people that, that are unbeliever, even dating people. Uh, listen, it, don't ever date somebody that's not a believer saying, well, it'll never amount to anything. Because too many times you call it love and you get married and then you're, you've got problems. <laughs> I got another word for love there, but I'm not going to say it. Hmm. <laughs> Verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Everybody say, I am the temple. Amen. We are the temple of the living God for living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my People. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. But keep the temple pure, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be, you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Skipping over to the book of Genesis, chapter 8. 
while the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest, winter and summer, cold and hot, day and night shall not cease. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel after Noah's, Adam's time and Noah's time and then came, came the time where the children of Israel, God was getting his nation together and God had the children of Israel build a temple in the desert and then they built a temple later on, you remember, in Jerusalem. But in the temple, there were, they had the outer courts where they would sacrifice animals for the sins of the people. Then they had what they called the holy place. And then they had the most holy place, which is the holies of holies. And this is a place where the Ark of the Covenant was. And, and it, was a, it was a place where only God dwelt through the Old Testament times. And this was a place where the high priest would go in to the holies of holies and he would purify himself before he entered this holy place. In the presence of God, he was allowed to come into the presence of God one time a year to offer sacrifices for the whole nation of Israel. And he was pure before God. He had to be pure before God in order to come into the presence of God. Skipping on down to the book of Ezekiel, it's talking about how that uh, people had begun, began to have a different perspective of God's temple. Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 21 in the NIV, it says this, it says, say to the people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am about to desecrate my sanctuary. The stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. Bear in mind, in the New Testament, the Bible says that we are the temple. Another, the New Living Translation puts it this way, what the Sovereign Lord says, I will defile my temple, he says. The source, the temple, which is the source of your security and pride, the place your heart delights in, which begs the question, what is the source of your security? Have you ever heard anybody say, I'm a self-made man? Well, that's a farce. You're not a, nobody, you didn't make yourself. God made you. He gave you every talent and every ability you have. But you see, when we begin to worship ourselves and we worship our bodies and we say, well, I, and we make it all about us. So here we have over in the, they, they have a name of God translation. It says, tell the nation of Israel, this is what Adonai Yahweh says. I'm going to dishonor my holy place. You brag that my holy place gives you strength. <laughs> work out. It's going to work out. Everything's going to be cool. <laughs> you brag that my holy place gives you strength. It's the thing you love the most. It's the thing you love the most. In other words... You love yourself the most. It's your heart's desire. So the sons and daughters that you left behind are going to die in battle. The consequences of dishonoring the sanctuary and the lesson behind it. God talks about this and we now live in what we call the church age. It's, or the dispensation of grace when God pours out this, <coughs> excuse me, this time period when his grace is poured out in large measures. So everyone will have the opportunity to accept him or to reject him in their lives. Ask him and invite him to take residence in their sanctuary. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door knock it. If anyone open, I will come in and I will be with him. Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. The reason is the first 
reason, the reason is first because as Adam had never sinned before the great temptation, Jesus never sinned even in his great temptation. Adam was the one who would bring life to the human race, and he failed at that. But Jesus never fails, and we can put our confidence in him. He brought eternal life as our personal redeemer from the curse of sin so we could be blameless before God, and we could come into his presence, the Father, and come into his presence with boldness, for he would make us his sanctuary, the place where his presence dwells. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, this is interesting. It says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, <coughs> Excuse me. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man, beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace unearned favor. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So here's the situation. The size of Noah's ark was huge. It ensured that they could carry thousands of animals. The dimensions of the ark was, was 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, with a capacity that, exceeding, that exceeds 500 railroad stock cars. The ark's Bars like shape made it difficult to capsize. This dramatic event demonstrated God's wrath towards sin. Still talking about the temple here. But his mercy toward those who will seek him and those who will prioritize who he is in their lives. The destruction of every living thing on earth was a result of man's decision not to trust God. I will say this in our culture today. Many people have trust issues because they've been messed around so many times. Uh, I've rode horses a lot in the mountains up in Colorado, Montana, all over. And one of the things, when you ride a horse up in the mountains, because you'll, you'll ride along trails, and I mean, it'll drop off for 150 feet. I mean, just straight off. And, and you got you to gotta get it on the horse. But you have to trust the horse. And if you don't trust the horse and you get nervous and you start doing this, you're going to take his eyes off of the trail and you're going to wind it. It ain't going to be pretty. So we, you have no option but to trust the horse. I was on a horse one time. A guy brought horses for us all to ride night. It was a two-year-old horse that hadn't been in the mountains before at all. And uh, we were on a trail on the side of the mountain and it, and it didn't drop straight off, but it dropped off pretty good. And the snow was about that deep and we was on this trail and this horse got tired and he just laid down <laughs> on the side of that mountain with me on him. That's not good. <laughs> the truth is, is that not everybody is trustworthy. It's just a, it's just a truth. Human nature. I mean, we, we are human beings and, and not everybody is trustworthy. Let me just counsel you this morning. Don't ever, ever compare man with God. God is completely trustworthy. And just like you got to give, you got to give the reins to them horses that have been up in the mountains all their life and they've been on them trails before. And you might think, oh, I don't know. You give them their head and let them get down. They'll get you down. They'll get you down safe. But you start taking a hold and you start jerking around. You're going to mess them up. It's the same way with God. When you start taking the reins yourself, you're not messing God up, but you're messing your own life up. 
So trust is important. So my point with that is that there is no peace where there is no trust. If you want peace in your life, it has to be a non-negotiable to trust God. You're just like, okay. Because you will reason and I reason because we reason among ourselves because we are reasonable people. We reason with God. Doesn't work very well. History in many ways has been extremely harsh at times. When you make a list of history's harshest scourges, rank the Black Plague near the top. There was, they say between 25 and 50 million people that died in the Black Plague. It earns a high spot, but definitely not the highest spot. Call the disease catastrophic. Call it disastrous. But humanity's deadliest? No, no, not even close. Scripture reserves that title for a much darker disease, an older pandemic that by comparison makes the Black Plague seem like a cold sore. From the days of Adam and Eve to Noah to the flood to today, no culture avoids it. No nation escapes it. No person sidesteps the infection of a three-letter word, and that word is sin. Blame the bubonic plague on the Yersinia pestis bacterium. Or for you country people, it's infected fleas on the backs of rats. That's what that is. Blame the birth of, of this plague caused sin on a single godless decision. Adam and Eve turned their head toward the hiss of a snake. And for the first time, they ignored God. Is there anybody here that's ever ignored God? My name is Randy Weaver. I've ignored God. You've ignored God. How do I know that? Preacher, you don't even know me. We have all sinned. And when we sin, we're ignoring God. Eve did not ask God, what do you want? Adam didn't suggest, let's consult our creator. Let's not talk to God about this. That's what happens a lot of times when we sin. We don't want God anywhere around. (laughs) I like the way you're looking at me. But they acted as if they had no heavenly father. The one who had authority over the old serpent of old was ignored and sin with death on its coattail entered the world. Sin sees the world without God in it. Sin would love for there not to be a God in this age. And there's a lot of people today in our day and time that would like to take God out of the situation. The ripple of today's lie. Max Lucado said this, the ripple of today's lie is tomorrow's wave of next year's flood. One little lie today turns into a flood. So what can we do if, if we've all been infected and the world is corrupted? To whom shall we turn? Well, the scripture re asks the question this way in Acts chapter 16, verse 13, 30. It says, what shall I do to be saved? What can save me from this? And then it says in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved from the plague of sin. God wants us to take a stand against sin. Oh, in Texas, I don't know if you knew it or not, but we have a stand your ground law. You know what that is, right? Don't tread on me. How many here this morning brought, brought your gun? You got your gun with you. Raise your hand. Not one. You should have been in my other service. Maybe a third of them raised their hand. It's like, man, if somebody walks in there with a gun, hit the ground. Friendly fire. You never know who's going to have it. In other states, they call it the castle law, where you, you defend your own castle, your own castle. 
You know, and, and uh, uh, a lot of y'all got your, got your gum by your bed. It's in the little, yeah, same one. <laughs> so, we're so, we're so, we're bent on protecting ourselves in Texas. We're kind of, we're kind of into that. Kind of a good thing, too. I don't think it's a bad thing to defend yourself. But we can be so dogmatic about defending our house. But how dogmatic are we about defending our temple? You know, we're like, don't come in my house. I'll plug you in. <laughs> what about your temple? Are you, are you as, as convicted about this temple as you are about your own house? Or do you like, yeah, oh, that's not a big deal. Then we begin to justify the things, the plague of sin in our lives. We justify, listen, to me, there's only one that justifies. It's not you. God is the only one that can justify. We cannot, we do not have the ability to just justify ourselves. When we do that, we have allowed an idol to come into God's sanctuary, a place that is only reserved for him. Stand our ground against sin, which may be challenging at best personally and very offensive to many publicly. Listen, it's not a popular thing anymore for you or for me to defend our personal relationship with Jesus. When it comes to our decision to follow Christ, sometimes we do it all by ourselves, but it's always Better and much easier to stand with others when we share our convictions. That's why we have life groups. That's why we have church. That's why we have the word of God in us, God's seed. When God saw evil in the earth, he destroyed all the living things with the exception of Noah's family and the animals to replenish the earth. So in closing, I want to ask you the question, what kind of seed are you allowing in your sanctuary? Here's what happened after the ark landed on dry ground after the flood in Genesis 6, 20. It says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Now, in my reasoning, I would have, I would have like, Oh, no, we're not going to do that because we need all them animals because the earth don't have no animals on it. We need more animals. We can't, be, we can't be wasting those animals on a sacrifice. Y'all looking at me like, do you, is there anybody here that you just kind of reason among yourself or with yourself and you think, you think because you thought of it, you're right? Too many times we reason God's word out of the sanctuary. It says it was a sweet smelling aroma to God. In other words, Noah did the right thing. What was the thing he did? He worshiped. Then he went on. Then Noah built an altar. It says, then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy everything I, as I have done. Verse 22, while the earth remains, that means as long as the earth remains in the Greek, it's like as long as the earth is, remains. That's what it means. As long as the earth is here, seed time and harvest Cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. And it hasn't ceased since the day God made this covenant with the earth. When Noah built an altar, God spoke the law of seed, time, and harvest. After the great flood, the Lord spoke to Noah. He told him to let every creature that creeps to go about its way of life, followed by Noah when he built an altar to offer up the sacrifice. 
Then the Lord gave his covenant. Seed time and harvest is a law first. It is a principle second that will always be around whether we have a consciousness or an unconsciousness of it. Whether we realize that there is seed time and harvest or we don't realize that there is seed time and harvest, there will always be seed then there will be time and then there will be a harvest and we will always harvest what we sow. Whatever seed we sow in life is the seed that we will grow. Anything you do in life has to do with seeds that you sow. You can sow good seeds into your marriage. You can sow seeds of love into your marriage. You can sow hard work into your business. You can sow seeds of love into your children. You can see, sow seeds of honor into your parents. There are things that God loves. I don't know if you knew it or not, but weeds have seeds too. <laughs> and if we're not careful, weeds will grow up. And if we don't go in and tear those weeds out, those weeds will take over the good seeds. Thank you. Then the Lord gave his covenant, seed time and harvest. It's a law first because it is a direction that we are to live by. It's a principle because we apply to we apply it to literally everything and every area of our lives has to do with seeds that we have sown. Many times we've sown seeds that we wish we would not have sown. And the harvest has come. God still forgives us, but we still have to walk through the harvest that we didn't want. The parable of the sower is an interesting one. And we preached it about a few weeks back. But the seed, the scripture says, is the word of God. Some of the seed was thrown, sown by the wayside and, and, and uh, the devil stole it. Some was, was thrown on the rocks and it didn't have any roots. And some fell among the thorns and the thorns choked, choked it. And some fell on good ground. And that's those who have having the, heard the word of God with a noble and good heart. Keep it, bear fruit with patience. In other words, when we have the seed, the seed goes into the ground we, it, we take care of the seed and it bears fruit with patience. So it takes time for seeds to be sown and for them to be grown. We have to plant the word, use the word, water it, clean out the weeds from around it. Keep the bugs from it so that it can grow properly and wait on the word to be performed in our lives, to trust God with his word. A prime example of how someone's true heart can affect is found in 1 John 4, 19. It says, we love him because he first loved us. When he sowed that seed in you, you're like, he put that seed in you, you're like, hmm. What about that cowboy church? We might ought to go to church. I feel like, I kind of feel like I ought to go to church. That's that, that's that seed taking root. And it's not about the church. It's not about the sanctuary. It's about the church and it's about the sanctuary. Jesus Christ sowed, actually sowed the greatest gifts of all because of his seed of love, we can now have a harvest of his love. Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. A lot of, a lot of people want to reap a harvest of God's blessings without ever sowing the seed of the word of God in themselves. I hear people from time to time, they say, well, I didn't go to that. I'm not going to that church because I'm not getting fed. That's, that's just the most popular excuse for not going to a church. I just like, let me, let me just, let me just say this. If you're not getting fed, it's not my fault. 
If you can read, if you can listen, you can get the word of God in you. Yeah, we, we, we're here to feed you sound doctrine and feed you the word, but we're here to equip you for the work of the ministry. You know, well, I thought that was your job. Well, it's not just my job. It's all of our jobs. We are here as workers together for the kingdom of God. I would most humbly say that a lot of times the reason for anxiety, the reason for worry, the reason for fear in our lives, the reason for depression a lot of times in our lives, the reason for a lot of things is because we don't sow the word of God in our sanctuary and we have too many other things that are taking God's place in our sanctuary. This local church is here today because we made it through a famine. We made it through drought. We made it through times of discouragement. We made it through spiritual terrorists. However, we are, we're encouraged, supported, prayed over, been in prayer, planted seed. The enemy tried, but we came through every storm. Now we have harvested the benefit some of the benefits of our obedience. Had we let the devil sink his teeth into our foundation of what God has planned for us, the battle would have been lost. See, when we're standing in between the seasons of sowing and the seasons of reaping, you've got to have faith and live by that faith. That's the time part of seed time and harvest. And you will never, you, you will never reap a harvest until we turn loose and we put it in the ground. Too many times, they, a lot of people, they sow it, they put it in the ground, then they dig it up and go, mm, how come you're not growing? Put it back. Mm, what's going on? Leave it alone. Let God have it. Let me say that again. I'm going to make myself more clear here in a minute. I said, let it go. Yes. Amen. Let God have it. Trust him with it because he is trustworthy. Amen. Bad weather may hit, bad weather doesn't stay. Hurricanes come and hurricanes go. God's word is stronger than any storm coming your way because he can say, peace, be still. <laughs> your faith will prove the harvest, but action is important too. Act upon your faith. Many today in modern church are waiting for a harvest, but they forgot to plant the seed. Hmm. He's pruning those individuals that want the glory for themselves that only belongs to him. He may be pruning you, you because you want his glory. His desire is to remove those strongholds in your own personal life that have taken residence in your temple, whether it be family members or your spouse or your kids or your parents. This place that only is reserved for God. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says this, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. So the word in your God, the word in your heart sparingly, what that means is only get the word in you when you come to church, maybe, or just like once a week or when it's convenient, that's what you'll reap. And he which sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You put a lot of the word in you, a lot of the word will come out. Every man according to as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And it's not just talking about the offering. Too many times we, we as preachers, we use this verse a lot when you're taking the offering. But it's, it's one of the, it's, it's, that's just a small part of it. 
give and it shall be given. We give of ourselves. We give of our time. We give of our talent, the things that we have. We give of our treasure. I mean, no matter where you go and no matter what you do, you still belong to God and you are God's spokesman in your job, when you go shopping, when you're out with the kids. No matter what you're doing, you are still sowing seeds of righteousness in other people whenever you walk in the spirit because the spirit rules the sanctuary. The harvest is a reflection of seed sown. Well, I'm just always angry. Hello. What are you listening to? Soap operas? What are you you listening to? People fighting all the time? You like to fight? Well, you're probably listening to a lot of fighting. That's a lot of seed that's going in you. (laughs) This isn't easy to preach, but I just had to laugh for a second. Matthew 6, says this. It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these other things will be added to you. Be careful. Be careful what you let inside. I, I saw an advertisement for a spa. It says, worship your body. It's the sanctuary of your soul. Oh, yeah. Worship your body. Yeah, now some of y'all, you're just like, Oh, I can't believe anybody would say that. We have people all over the world worship their bodies. It's so important. (laughs) Have a look. (laughs) It's what God wants for you. Yeah, I like I appreciate y'all taking getting cleaned up. I appreciate that. But we don't need to take, go overboard with ourselves and begin to worship where, where oh, I got a pimple. I can't go to church. It's not about you anyway. You come to church for him. You come to church to worship him. Your blessing is a residual effect of your worship of God. Church is for God. It's not for you. You're going to get blessed by church. That's the plan. But God is the one that's going to be doing the blessing because you worshiped him first. We don't have church for you. We have church for him. We come together, join together for worship. Most high God. The residual effect is we are healed. We are purified. We are in his presence. The gift of his presence. But the truth is, is that you brought his presence with you when you walked in the door because he was in your sanctuary. I'm going to quit with this. I promise. (laughs) Say again what they said in Ezekiel. The message says this is what Adonai Yahweh, God, says, I'm going to dishonor my holy place. You brag that my holy place gives you strength. It's the thing you love the most. It's your heart's desire. So the question is, what do you love the most? Have you let what you love the most in your sanctuary. And if we've let what or who, because people can, we can let them in our sanctuary. We can let things, things in our sanctuary. We can let the Texans, oh boy. We can let roping in our sanctuary. We can let golfing in our sanctuary. We can let our husbands, our wives, our kids. Anytime you let anybody or anything in your sanctuary, it is they are your idol. I dare say that 99% of us, maybe 100% of us, at one point in time have been guilty 
of allowing idols to come into our sanctuary. My name is Randy Weaver. I'm guilty of it. The Lord began speaking this message to me a couple months ago because I've been terrible about letting my kids, I let my parents, sometimes my wife, and, and let me just be clear here. You can't be a good husband if your wife is running your sanctuary. You can't be a good wife if your husband is running your sanctuary. You can't be a good mama if you allow your kids to run your life. You can't be a good mama and daddy if you allow your adult kids to run your life. You can't be a good son or a daughter when you're living at home, you are under the authority of your mom and dad. And when you defy that authority, you are defying God's, the way God set up a home. And God will not bless you as children if you don't honor your mom and daddy. By the way, that works for adult children as well. You say, oh man, preacher, getting awful real with me you know what the the, this word is life or death spiritual life or death and God will not share his sanctuary with anybody or anything your body is a sanctuary for God and only God let him rule in your heart in your mind, in your body, and in your soul. And you will be blessed as you sow his word into your life. It will bring life and peace and joy and long suffering and gentleness and meekness and temperance. All of the good things of life will be yours because you have prioritized the sanctuary that God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word this morning. We're just, we're just blown away by you today and by your presence. And Holy Spirit, I know that you're doing a, a lot of work in people's lives right now. Or oh, we humble ourselves before you, O oh God, realizing how desperate we are for your truth, for the word of God living inside of us. Lord, we repent as a church, as individuals, Lord, for allowing other things and other people into the place that is only reserved for you, O oh God. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that you would help everybody in the sound of my voice, everybody watching online. I pray, O oh God, that you'd help us not to, not to uh, be, not c- to confuse this message with, with what we do so much as to who we are. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And when we realize that, we'll want to take care of the tabernacle that you built us in, in us. Thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus' name. I'd like for you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a second. If you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, that's the, the, the main message with this is that Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open, I'll come in and be with him. What he's saying is that, that I will come and be a part of your life and allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart. So this morning, if you've never invited him into your life, or maybe if you have, you just haven't been living for him, Simply, simply by raising your hand, say, Preacher, I need Jesus in my heart. I need to make him the Lord of my life. Slip your hand up high. Don't be ashamed. It's the greatest, greatest thing you'll ever do in your life. We want to put a Bible in your hand. Preacher, I need Jesus in my heart. I need to make him the Lord. If you've never invited Christ, or maybe if you have, you just haven't been living for him, slip your hand up high. We don't want to miss anybody. Anybody.
you. What a privilege. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Anybody else? Preacher, that's me. Don't be ashamed of God. Jesus sure wasn't ashamed of you when he hung on the cross. It's the greatest privilege, the greatest gift you'll ever have. I know Christmas is gone, but this is better than Christmas. Anybody else? Preacher, that's me. Amen. This one that raised your hand. If you raise your hand, would you mind looking up at me? If you raise your hand, would you mind coming up and let me pray with you? Would you mind coming up? Come on up and let me pray with you. I'd be honored to pray with you if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah. Come on, buddy. Yeah. I don't want to embarrass you, but, man, this is important stuff. So proud of you. Man, I'm so proud of you. Look at you. What's your name? Jacob. Jacob. I love you, man. Did you know that, that God named Israel after Jacob? Did you know that in the Bible? Yeah. The children of Israel is Jacob. That's what it meant. He changed his name to Israel. But that would be you. That's God's chosen people. Then you're God's chosen man for the day. So I want to pray for you, okay? Here's what the Bible says. It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised you from the dead, that we'll be saved. So what I want to do, I want to help you pray. And you, but you got to believe in your heart. I can't do that for you, okay? So just repeat after me. Y'all help us pray. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, dear Lord Jesus thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Lord, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. From this day forward, I give my life to you. Help me to read my Bible, to pray, show up for church, and get baptized. I love you, Jesus. Teach me to love you more. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, here's what, that, here's what just happened. You invited God to be a part of your temple, the tabernacle. So wherever you go now, he's going with you. He said he'd never leave you, never forsake you. You take care of this place. He'll take care of you. Keep showing up. Is, is it like, like in the, the, the African movies, they always pick on the weak ones. The devil picks on the weak ones. You stay hooked up with God's people. God will help you. Jacob, love you, buddy. Go visit that lady for just a second, please. Stand with me, please. convicted you today that there's something or someone that you've allowed in your temple and uh, just being honest you'll say preacher I need to reserve that place only for God and I really need to just let God have his place on his throne in my life. So if your hand up high, preacher, that's me. And honestly, it's probably 199% because we're, we're like, we are, most of us need that, amen? amen? What I love about this church, one of the things, many, but one of the things I love is y'all are so honest. Y'all just like, well, yep, that's me. That's a good place for healing is an honest heart. Remember the CEO? God's like that. He's looking for honest people. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. Be honest with your friends and your people and let God heal what is hurt and the plague of sin in your life. Amen. Amen. So let's all raise our hands and surrender to God. 
Lord, as you see our hands, oh God, we surrender to you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that you are our Savior. I pray, oh God, that you would help us, Lord, to daily clean the temple. I pray, oh God, Holy Spirit, that you would help us, oh God, as we put our faith and our confidence in you and in the blood that you sacrificed for our salvation, Lord, as we put our faith and our confidence in you, oh God, that we do our part as well by, by bringing in the word of God into our lives, into our mind and our, our bodies and our souls. And I pray, oh God, that you'd help us to participate in the cleansing of the temple. I pray, oh God, that you administer to everybody here, Lord, as you have convicted us as we walk through the week, oh God. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to, as with this message marinates in us, oh God, that you would continue to convict us. We give you permission. Everybody say, I give you permission, God, to teach me about myself and to be real with you, to purify me before you thank you for living in me i love you jesus in jesus name i pray the church said all right i smell victory i don't know if y'all smell it or not i smell victory got a prayer team up here if you need special prayer love to have you god bless you have a great week thanks for coming